morning. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Pity. Uh, I stand before you as, uh, as the dean uh, described the sorts of people that will, will speak today as a practitioner. Um, I am not um, in the United States government uh, parlance a policy person. I'm a practitioner. And so given all the grand theory that has swirled about this summer about uh, arguing for one perspective, one, uh, one attribute or another of various legal policy or security regimes, um, I stand at the place within the United States government where I actually have to put practice uh, or theory to practice and to reconcile all those various tensions. And what I would hope to do today is to just lay out some very broad themes quickly and then quickly go to dialogue. I would very much like to take your questions. I'm here really for two reasons. Uh, first, Sam asked. Uh, I have enormous respect for Sam for the work that he, Zach, and others do here. Um, two, for the possibility there might be some number of students in their formative period who we could perhaps um, help understand, um, if not believe, help understand the perspective that I enjoy with respect to these very serious matters. Bob Schieffer, uh, who modulates a, or moderates a very uh, good show on most Sunday mornings, said something I thought was uh, quite true about the July time frame of this summer. He said, never in the field of national security have so many understood so little about so much. <laughs> I think that's quite true. I think that there has been a battle of sound bites this summer practiced by all sides, not just two sides, but many sides in this debate. And what I think is really important is, as the Dean said last night, is that we kind of figure out what are the facts, what's the policy, what's the law, and try to reconcile those, try to come up with some uh, regimes or some framework that would allow us to proceed to effect um, at once all the various things that we would want to. Um, I thought I'd begin by kind of showing uh, this slide. For those of you who sat in the back row, shame on you. <laughs> uh, but this slide really doesn't require much uh, in the way of uh, close examination to appreciate. Uh, this is an actual uh, presentation um, from what was a uh, classic red dot, a series of command and control nodes, bots, um, around the world. Um, which essentially combined their collective efforts to launch this denial of service attack. Um, you might have heard about this in the press. So it was described um, as something uh, between a nuisance and a bother in terms of what was happening in the U.S. financial sector. Um, but I show this slide to say that uh, we do not suspect that these attacks were mounted by Europe um, or by, that, for that matter, um, Australia, which seems to be both a uh, victim and uh, prosecutor in this regard or any number of entities, say, down in Brazil or, or those countries. And we have actually high confidence that this was attributable to a single entity, well, well located, well fixed, um, somewhere on the planet that wouldn't be completely obvious from this particular slide. But such is the nature of the internet, the property of convergence, where we all share these pathways, we all live on the common pathways, use the common services, um, that if you're simply looking at the surface level, it's really hard to sort this out. A speech that I sometimes give about the true nature of the internet, at least from a technologist's perspective, where I describe it as a domain, a domain in its own right that has unique characteristics. Um, those unique characteristics, like any domain of interest um, in the world, um, have two bookends, uh, which it has in common with uh, the other domains. First of those bookends would be planet Earth. If the domain doesn't have somehow a foothold, a nexus, a foundation of planet Earth, then you'd have to ask, why do we really care about that? And the other bookend would be that it serves, supports, it's actually related to people. Right? Those two bookends for cyberspace in common with other bookends give us perhaps the boundaries, the left and right limits of what perhaps transpires in cyberspace. Uh, but unlike other domains where those are experienced with those bookends, either with geography or with people, give us some broad insights into how um, cyberspace actually works. Cyberspace continually breaks our hearts. Cyberspace actually doesn't respect right, the experience that we've gained in terms of the territorial boundaries that are reflected in geography, in our experience with geography, or the physical uh, realities of how things move on the planet Earth. If you were to ask someone, this I won't ask you, I'll simply give you the answer and the question, um, how does communication move from New York City to San Francisco in the middle of an American day? Most students of geography would say, oh, that's pretty simple. Um, moves on a westerly course, probably about 3,000 miles, some number of milliseconds later, it gets to San Francisco. It's not necessarily the right answer. Um, cyberspace understands that those pipes are probably clogged in the middle of an American day as all manner of things are being communicated back and forth of a busy population. Um, but that at that moment in time, it might well be that the pipes elsewhere on the planet are empty because those people should be sleeping. Now, they don't always sleep, but they should be. And so that communication more is likely than not 
would move east. They would go across the Atlantic, across Europe, across China, across the Pacific, and get to San Francisco as quickly, if not more quickly, than if it took what a geography student would say would be the most reasonable course. Uh, the vagaries of how things actually move, uh, the royal of technology and the royal of operational practice in that space defies most of the experience that we brought to this party, most of the experience that we brought to cyberspace, um, in a way that first and foremost, we have to really stop, pause, and understand how technology works, how the operational practices of people who employ that technology work, and whether that does or does not comport with our expectations that are conferred by law or policy. At NSA, as a practitioner, my challenge on a daily basis um, is to affect my national security mission completely um, in respect to the law. Um, not simply um, trying to meet the law, but I must meet the law. But the challenge is, is that trying to reconcile and synchronize uh, the Constitution, the law, the policies that derive from that to the technology and the operational practice is very, very difficult. Not least of which is every time we seem to arrange them in some way that we say now they finally uh, relate to each other in the right proper way, we find that one of them or two of them changes um, at a rate, at a pace uh, that exceeds the other, uh, that they're not naturally synchronous. Most of the compliance incidents that NSA has experienced that I'm responsible for over the last few years have in fact been directly attributable to that phenomenon, that fact. The court, um, in its way, um, insists that I am enumerative exhausted in my explanation of what I will do and how I will do it. Um, and given the challenges that are actually kind of confronting me in cyberspace, at times the best I can do is be illustrative, to say you know, this then, at this moment in time, is what I can promise, but tomorrow's technology and tomorrow's operational practices will make that difficult. Um, we always have to err in favor of the law, um, but at various moments in time we'll find that we've actually exceeded um, our boundaries, we've kind of gone over the line not to excuse it, but to explain that those are the natural tensions in this space. What's then required is not to lean away from each other, um, the kind of legal minds and the technologists, and to therefore say we can't have a reconciliation, but to lean towards each other. And that's what I think uh, this dialogue um, is very, very uh, well placed to do, to have that dialogue. Second point that I would make, again, I'm only going to make four points and then open to questions, is that um, the oath that I take, and I've taken this oath now for 41 continuous years since my first days at the Air Force Academy, is not to an organization, it's not to a person, it's not even to um, a codicil of particular principles or values inside an organization, it's the Constitution. And I remind the people at NSA on a fairly regular basis, if not daily, that that Constitution speaks at once, right, to the values of security, which is in my name, National Security Agency, um, and the civil liberties that are both guaranteed by the same Constitution. Um, and that we cannot choose between them, we must try to find ways to affect both. So in the front of this podium, there's the scale of justice that would show that perhaps there's a balance to be made between contending views. Um, I'm not actually a fan of that particular um, rendition, of that particular uh, portrayal of the balance between national security and civil liberties. I think a more apt um, depiction might be two rails under a rail car such that each rail needs to be straight and true, needs to sit on a solid foundation in order for that train to make the progress that it should. We need to, stru we need to strive to actually affect both of those things. I mean, if we find that one is kind of falling um, kind of prey to another, we can stop, pause, and bring them back into balance, um, such that at the end of the day, we can hold our heads high and say we've tried to, and we have affected both national security and civil liberties. Um, with respect to um, intelligence as it's practiced within the United States, and not unlike many Western democracies, um, I would assert, and I would open this to your questions, that it is more constrained than it is enabled. You can still recall when I was briefed into the operational practices, my authorities at NSA, first time I had a, a real intelligence job. Uh, the lawyer who did that uh, said you should be um, mindful that uh, your authorities are explicitly delegated. Um, that is, that if it's not said that you can do something, then you must assume that you cannot. And I was an Air Force pilot for a while. I was quite used to that as an Air Force pilot. If it's not written down, you can, you can't. Um, my brother was a Navy pilot. And he used to remind me on a fairly regular basis that in the Navy, if it's not written down, that you can't, you can. Um, <laughs> Navy pilots have more fun. Um, and it's um, but I'm an Air Force pilot with respect to the rule of law at the National Security Agency. Um, if it's not written down that I can do it, I cannot. Um, and there's an additional constraint which is there must be some priority, there must be some reason that I'm actually prosecuting a national security mission, an intelligence mission, right up front. Now, the Europeans um, have a slightly different way of describing this, but they get to the same place. 
Europeans would say that um, in order to effect the right balance between uh, national security and privacy, and what we might call civil liberties in the American context, <coughs> there must be, as um, national security intrudes upon privacy, both a necessity um, and a kind of a relation of proportionality. That is, it must be necessary uh, for national security to intrude upon that privacy, and you must do it in a way that you're proportionate to that need. Um, that is, you can't overwhelm or overreach in your desire for national security. Um, in the United States, we get to that same place in a slightly different way. Uh, for me, at the National Security Agency, I must respond to the priorities that are given to me by the executive branch. Um, I must understand that what I'm doing is necessary. I don't get up in the morning and simply do what I can. Um, I have to actually be guided by those priorities. Um, and the priorities are numerous and exhaustive in the details that they can give me. Uh, priorities not simply about things like counterterrorism, but about instability in places like Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, about the progress of weapons of mass destruction, about the um, risk of economic instability, um, all as an instrument of national power, not personal power. All as an instrument of international power in those coalitions that we choose to join, which are many. Um, so that's essentially the top of the framework. Within that, I then have to determine if I have a bona fide priority, do I have an explicit authority right, to actually um, pursue that? Um, and the authorities have been well described across the summer, sometimes accurately, sometimes not. Uh, you might have heard in kind of some salacious moments about things like PRISM, 702, 215. Um, all of those are, in fact, discrete authorities granted explicitly to NSA. And they generally try to frame three different questions. What's the status of the person, the person of interest or, or the organization of interest? Um, and typically, in an American framework, is that person a U.S. person or not? Um, the U.S. person status is conveyed conferred on someone, not simply because you're a U.S. citizen, but if you're simply in the United States of America, you confer the protections under the Fourth Amendment. Um, that's the first question. But the second question that is usually asked uh, is, where is the person? Is that person in the United States or are they outside the United States? Um, that third question, um, which often then confounds, uh, because you sometimes get a different answer, is where does the collection take place? So used by way of example, the 702, or the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, Amendment Act of uh, 2008, by way of example. Um, what that authority tells me is that if I have the priority, that is I'm actually pursuing something that I should pursue, <coughs> essentially inform, enable an instrument of national or international power. Um, if I have the priority, then if the person of interest um, to me, in order to understand the answer to that intelligence question, is a foreign person, and if they're in a foreign place, that's the first two questions, then I'm authorized to find their communications on U.S. infrastructure. That's the third question. Um, if, in fact, those three answers don't line up as you know, that, the, those particular answers, foreign, foreign, domestic infrastructure, and I continue to pursue that person, then I'll find that I'm actually using the wrong authority um, for what otherwise might be a valid purpose. Um, and I would describe that as a compliance incident, or if I catch that early enough, as an incident um, in its own right. Uh, that semantic um, is important, and I'll explain um, a little bit later in the presentation um, where perhaps uh, we um, run afoul and perhaps uh, come to the wrong conclusions about the properties of NSA. I um, would say that uh, it's not just that simple that uh, I have discrete authorities and uh, just number them off as, you know, I have an executive order that allows me, it's called 12333, to pursue foreign intelligence when I am overseas. And of course, the target of my interest would be overseas. There are kind of things governed by the court that would allow me to use U.S. infrastructure to pursue things that are quantified foreign intelligence. Um, and in the main, my responsibility at the National Security Agency is to pursue foreign intelligence. Um, I do not and cannot chase the content of U.S. person communications absent a warrant. Um, and it is generally not um, efficacious, efficient for me to do that. Um, there's no foreign intelligence, for the most part, to be found here. Um, and so other instruments of national power were brought to bear in that regard. Uh, but those few authorities actually kind of mask uh, what the true complexity of the world is for me. Um, there are literally thousands of documents that convey those authorities from various courts, from various uh, parties who essentially oversee the execution of those. At any moment in time, my analysts actually have to be familiar with upwards of a thousand or more documents that essentially are the specific testimony that I might have given to the court, orders that the court might have given me, um, interpretations made by the Department of Justice, so it's a pretty complicated landscape. 
Um, that is not to say that we have an excuse to not meet those orders of the court, but it's a very, very complicated affair. Which is then why the third part of what I have to think about is I do my mission, right? So it's the priorities, it's the authorities, it's the controls, it's the third part that I spend a lot of my time and attention as the Chief Operating Officer for NSA worrying about. What are, in fact, the expectations that come along with those authorities? What are the controls imposed? Um, oftentimes, internal at NSA, we call that oversight and compliance. Um, I have upwards of 300 people who work that on a full-time basis. Um, but NSA is not the fox watching its own hen house. The Department of Justice has very intrusive um, insight into NSA. I think that's appropriate. Um, the Department of Defense, which essentially I'm hosted in the Department of Defense, has oversight of NSA, and that is somewhat intrusive. The Director of National Intelligence has oversight of NSA. That's very intrusive, appropriately so. Uh, the National Security Division of the Department of Justice has oversight of NSA. Um, they're there on a regular basis. But for most of my authorities, no less frequently than every 60 days, essentially reviewing the books. And then, of course, behind them, you've got the courts, um, the courts that might oversee some of our authorities, the congressional intelligence committees, um, and various then um, extra constitutional bodies like the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Uh, there's no lack, uh, there's no dearth of uh, insight into what NSA does on a regular basis. Add to that the fourth estate, which again, we welcome um, that intrusive kind of look at what we do. Um, and we're actually pretty well governed in that space. And if anything, what you have is a cacophony of views that sometimes cause confusion um, in the mind's eye of the reader. Again, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about that. Um, I'd like to just, in the fourth point, just talk about what I think the opportunity this summer and this fall um, <coughs> is. Um, there's a, Marty Dempsey, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has this great quote. I'm not sure that he was thinking of this particular um, moment in our nation's history to apply it but it applies nonetheless, which is, in this crisis, you should miss an opportunity to effect a great transformation. I mean, I think at this moment in time, um, while I would argue that we have always had our mind's eye on effecting um, the right combination of national security and civil liberties, so I wouldn't argue that we reset that, though I think we need to illuminate the controls on that and have some confidence that we do effect that. I do think we're going to have to rebalance the balance between um, privacy, security, and transparency. Right, the secrecy that attends to the former in terms of the secret methods that we want to hold away from our adversaries um, and the transparency that is required to have the confidence not simply of elected officials or overseers within the executive branch or for that matter the courts, but the American public who essentially convey, confer upon those elected representatives the authority to act on their behalf. I think that that has been uh, weakened, if not uh, damaged, uh, across the summer and the fall. And we're going to have to have dialogues like this, and we're going to have to have some greater illumination of control, and possibly the addition of additional control um, to win back that confidence that these are authorities that are brought to bear um, in the genuine best interest of the American public, and for that matter, allies, coalitions that we choose to join. Um, and so that's an opportunity that lies before us. But I'd also offer that an opportunity that lies before us um, is to rethink you know, whether intelligence, the thing that I practice on a daily basis, is simply an instrument of national power, or is it increasingly an instrument of international power? If you look at this particular slide, um, again, we don't think that all the various nations that seem to be hurling these um, denial of service attacks at us, these nerf balls coming from afar, we don't think that they're complicit in that plot. Uh, the question before the United States is, do we work this independent of them, or do we reach out to them to say this is a common threat, this is a common challenge, much like counterterrorism, where terrorism is a common challenge and therefore use this as an opportunity to increasingly see intelligence as an instrument of international power. Um, I think there are some bodies of practice that would say that uh, there's a lot of profit to come from that. Uh, within the United States intelligence community, there's a term of art called Five Eyes, which really is a reference to the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, um, which essentially practice intelligence in many regards, especially in my line of work, um, in a combined way essentially make sure that we uh, leverage one another's capabilities for mutual benefit, never asking one another to do something that might be um, inappropriate or that is inappropriate or illegal for another party. So there's a lowest common denominator in terms of what you're allowed to do, but using this instrument of national power for international benefit. Coalitions have also practiced this um, to good effect. In Afghanistan, there's a coalition of 14 nations um, through the combat phase, and now through the key leader engagement phase, and the reconstitution of the organs of government, um, essentially work together to try to understand what the lay of the land is, what the threats are, what the opportunities are, and those 14 nations sharing information 
have essentially um, combined their efforts in a way that intelligence is an instrument of international power working for them. Um, I'd like to close with just a couple of what I might call myth clusters. Um, so you may have heard uh, perhaps discussion about these things, but I'd like to give you an alternate view, not so much to kind of prove or disprove right, the points that I would make, but to say that I think that the reason discussion that I hope takes place in this room is the true remedy for a battle that has been a battle of sound bites across the summer and fall. And I look forward to a dialogue that actually gets down to brass facts. You may have heard that NSA violated privacy thousands of times based upon NSA's own report of saying uh, that there was uh, widely reported in the press um, a uh, document that NSA wrote the first quarter, the first three months of 2012, um, where it documented on an annualized basis, uh, the report was really focused on three months, but on an annualized basis, uh, we said that uh, we had 2,776 incidents. I'm well familiar with this report, so you know, I won't have to refer to any notes on this. Um, that report was immediately um, interpreted to mean that we had violated privacy, um, and, and at worst, uh, possibly the privacy of U.S. persons thousands of times, 2,776 times. A closer read of the report, though, and, and I would urge you if you have a concern about this, go read the report. The report. A closer read of the report would show that about 75% of those times, 2,065 of those times, um, it was an incident where um, the thing that we were actually interested in had changed its status, that it had moved from place A to place B. Remember earlier I said that the authorities that I could bring to bear take great care to understand what's the status of the thing, what's the location of the thing, where does the collection actually take place. And if one of those three things changes, you find yourself in a position where you're using the wrong authority to prosecute what is already a um, act of foreign intelligence collection. 2,065 times the thing of interest didn't check with me before it actually changed its status. And so I detected that, fixed that, purged the data attendant to that, um, and made it right. Um, I would describe those as a feature um, that we actually have a system that cares about that, um, that kind of cleans that up, does the right thing. So 75% of the time, it's not a violation of privacy, it's essentially the system working just as it should. The remaining 711 out of the 2,776 were in fact errors, uh, but none willful. None of those um, were an analyst got up in the morning and tried to do the wrong thing. And they were strewn across the activities that I would describe as forming a selector, perhaps forming a telephone number or email selector, and aiming that through a collection device um, at a target that I was authorized to chase, um, or querying a database of collected material that I already had in house, um, or disseminating something to some number of persons, um, authorized customers. We made a mistake 711 times in that. Um, again, none willful. Um, mostly, um, I'd say the vast preponderance of those were actually far focused on foreign persons, foreign targets. And the fact that we fat fingered or got that number wrong is something that we caught, that we fixed, um, such that we actually are careful enough about our authorities that we protect the privacy of innocent foreigners uh, as much as we protect the privacy of innocent um, U.S. citizens. Um, and if you took those 711 errors and said, but they're still errors, they're still things for which you should be accountable, I would agree. If you took those and you attributed those to all the analysts that NSA has, you would find that our um, success rate in terms of getting it exactly right is 99.99984. Um, that's a pretty good success rate. That the average analyst at NSA makes a mistake about every 10 years or more. Um, and I too would say that's shocking, that's far too much. Um, we need to fix that. And, and I'm not being facetious, um, I'm not even trying to be humorous. I'd say that one error is too many. That's essentially our goal, our objective. But I would ask you to consider the fact that the royal of technology, the royal of implementation of that technology, makes that really hard. And so I'm willing to be held to a greater degree of accountability for um, tracking those things, finding those things, reporting those things. Um, but I would tell you that if we mean to do national security, if we mean to inform the instruments of national power um, that this nation and others bring to bear in using intelligence, um, such that we don't catch the terrorist at the airport, we don't catch the proliferation as it arrives at the point of implementation or use, um, we don't find cyber threats as they actually destroy the computer system, that we understand them in their incipient phase, we're going to have to figure out how to get that closer to right and have confidence that um, we won't so much avoid these errors altogether, I'm not excusing it, um, but that we will quickly determine them, discover them, fix them, and report them so that there can be appropriate accountability. Um, if you could hold that call for me, please. <laughs>
Um, last thing I would say is that um, we made much hay across the summer about saying that in the programs that were of most interest, the 702 program, the lawful intercept, um, and the 215 program, the collection of telephone metadata for which I'm happy to answer any questions, that there are no willful errors in that across the life of those programs from 2006 forward. Um, and yet later, um, what came out was that um, using other authorities, our overseas authorities, there had in fact been um, 12 occurrences of willful errors on the part of um, NSA um, employees. It turns out if you look inside of that, seven of those were NSA employees, and um, five were employees of another organization that essentially works with us and properly extends our authorities for their purposes. Um, but seven of them were NSA employees, and they were willful errors. Um, they misused the SIGINT system, my intelligence system, to essentially try to find the communications of another person in a way that was inappropriate. There was no priority, and while there might have been an authority, had there been a priority, they misused it. We discovered that, we fixed that, they were all held to account. Um, the vast majority of those persons that they were interested in were foreign persons, um, such that we try to hold harmless, innocent foreign persons as much as U.S. citizens. But I would ask you to consider that um, against two factors. Um, not excuse it, but consider that against two factors. Um, one, there are tens of thousands of NSA employees who do this work on a daily basis, um, and a far greater proportion than 99.99984 of them are kind of honest and faithful to that. Um, but at the same time, during that same 10-year period where those uh, seven NSA employees willfully misused the system, all of them were held to account, 20 NSA employees lost their lives in harm's way, because NSA um, essentially goes in some difficult places. Um, and they're inscribed on what we call the NSA memorial wall um, inside my headquarters building. We don't much make, make too much play of that, um, but that's really when I think of the NSA employee, what I think about. And they don't so much then um, defend our, um, our outcomes in terms of saying that we're error free and we should get a clean uh, kind of sweeping build of, of a great, great report card on that. But to say that at the end of the day, uh, the typical NSA employee is not unlike me, except they're typically smarter, they're typically more handsome, as General Alexander would say, they're a debonair. Um, the typical NSA employee comes to NSA for the same reasons I did 26 years ago. Uh, because they have this skill that they want to bring to bear, because they want to make a difference, they want to have some higher noble purpose kind of um, at the middle of their life. Uh, pretty much, I think, like most of you studying the law do, that you're not so much about the practice of law as you are about perhaps somehow affecting a greater, higher form of justice. Um, and then at the end of the day, they were born and raised in the same places, um, sometimes in this country, sometimes not. We tend to be a much more, because that intellectual diversity and richness is what actually gives us the brain trust necessary to prevail in these times. Um, and at the end of the day, they care as passionately about civil liberties, national security, uh, both, as any of you might. We agree with our harshest critics. We should not choose between those two. We must affect both. And we mean to be held accountable for that. And at the end of the day, they stay and stay and stay at NSA, not for the swell pay, the swell parking, or the great buildings. If you go to the NSA, um, you'll immediately um, discern that they're probably built by the Corps of Engineers using a scheme of paint that no one would steal from a warehouse. <laughs> um, they stay at NSA because they make a difference. They stay at NSA because they believe that that higher national purpose or that international benefit um, is one that's worthy of their time and attention. If I worry about anything in the midst of this dialogue, um, it's that we're causing um, them to reconsider whether that work is respected. They don't want to be rewarded for that or enumerated in that uh, with respect to money, um, but they do want to know that at the end of the day that work does make a difference in a way that's appreciated by the nation. And so part of my job is to defend their work when it's worth defending, and I think it is. Um, to explain that work and to figure out how we then make a greater accounting of that work to you or through you to the American public. So I'd be happy to take any and all questions that you might have. I think that uh, we probably have the better part in another 15, 20 minutes, so please, sir. I'm Burt Wides. I'm a pro bono advocate in Washington, and i focused for a lot of the last 50 years on the balance of civil liberties and national security. By way of background, I was counsel to President Carter for oversight of all U.S. Sir, if you can just ask the question. Thank you so I will. Yeah. Counsel to President Carter for oversight of all U.S. intelligence agencies and co-wrote the original FISA and the amendments. And I appreciate a very comprehensive uh, talk and how incredibly complicated your job is. But I'd like to ask you to, if you can, comment a little bit on the parallel tracks you mentioned. 
You said that in NSA you viewed your authority as being limited to what is explicitly authorized. And if it isn't explicitly authorized, you can't do it. I wonder if you could comment at all on how that relates to the comments of Congressman Sensenbrenner, who is closest, and I was there, to the author of the current 215, who said that he was stunned at the NSA interpretation of that to include the degree to which it was applied to getting even metadata of all U.S. phone calls. Yeah, I have no question or no reason to, uh, to question Senator Brenner's statement, but would say the following. That as that authority arrives in terms of something that is implementable at NSA, um, it had uh, benefited from what General Hayden, the prior director of NSA, former director of the CIA, deputy director or the deputy of the DNI, or the director of national intelligence, said was the trifecta, right? That authorized by Congress under Section 215 of the Patriot Act, interpreted um, by the executive branch, presented to the courts, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, um, it essentially kind of was represented to NSA, turned back to NSA as an authority to collect the metadata of all telephone calls into, out of, and within the United States for a narrowly framed purpose, the purpose of detecting a terrorist plot into the United States of America, a foreign terrorist plot, no other purpose, right? And so the balance, um, again, the kind of dual um, application of that, to essentially affect a national security purpose, detecting those terrorist blocks, at the same time protecting civil liberties, that is confining it to only that narrowly framed purpose, um, had the eyes of all three branches of government. And NSA then is in a place where it executes that, as opposed to we got up one morning and said, I really would like to have the records of all of those telephone calls, and therefore, at my own discretion, and using my own inherent authority, we'll go get those, use those, prosecute those, because I think that's in the best interest of the country. Um, I think the trifecta, the kind of three-part uh, approach of the government to essentially um, interpret, to pass the legislation, to interpret that legislation, to govern that legislation, and to impose controls on that legislation, uh, was, in my view, what the framers of the Constitution had intended. Now, one or more parties in that dialogue um, might not have um, been completely comfortable with how that then was um, enhanced or modified by another branch of government. That's a policy matter, and that's something that we can and should put back on the table to say, do we like that balance? Um, but I would say that from an NSA perspective, um, you know, the fact that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Board has, I think it's either 34 or 35 times, recertified that interpretation as being um, constitutionally appropriate and, and lawful and consistent with what they interpret the law to have been. Um, and the fact that then the executive branch has executed that faithfully um, is, in my view, the way that the government is supposed to work. Now, at this moment in time, if Congressman Sensenbrenner or others say, I'd like to revisit that, that is very appropriate, very appropriate. And NSA or any other organization within the executive branch should not push back. It should um, actually kind of willfully and, and um, kind of in an enthusiastic way participate in it. And that's actually been the stock and trade across the summer and the fall. Does that answer your question, sir? It should. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, so one of the things that's struck me in reading a lot of the documents that's kind of come out recently is how technologically complex a lot of the, the collection and <laughs> treatment of data seems to be. Uh, and your remarks reflect that as well as you talk about how technology is changing so quickly. And so what I'm wondering is how can the public have confidence that the overseers, it, both in the executive branch and especially on the congressional committees, have the sufficient technological know-how to actually understand both what the programs are doing and then also understand what sort of controls are possible and what effect those controls actually are going to have. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think the answer is embedded in your question, which is that um, it requires, um, if not an equal, at least a substantial facility that takes a look at the technology as much as the legal precepts and principles associated with that. Uh, used by way of example and anecdote, right? So back to the law that, sir, you helped pass in 1978. Uh, that law was um, not agnostic of technology. The law in 1978, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, said um, in practical terms that if a piece of communication is in the air, um, then by and large it's probably a satellite communication. It might then be presumed to be an international communication, therefore deserving of less regulation. And that same law in 1978 said that if a communication is on a wire, um, 
born and raised in the United States in those days. I knew that to be a local telephone call, right? A twisted wire, copper wire. Um, and that therefore deserves some very rigorous um, kind of oversight and regulation. Which is why the FISA uh, court from 1978 forward focused intensely on wire line communications um, and much less so on in the air communications. Now arrive in the middle 2000 period where a communication in the air more often than not was a cell phone call um, or something that was going back and forth to some kind of personal communications device. Uh, more often than not, if it was in the air, it was a domestic communication. And more often than not, if the communication was on a wire, it was on a fiber optic cable, today's version, right, of the twisted wire pair of 30 years ago. I mean, more often than not, those, given the kind of ratios in the world, more often than not, that's an international communication. Because the law had been technology specific and technology roiled away from it, we wound up essentially um, with a paradox that the law was focused on the wrong thing. And so the 2008 recast of that law tried to back away to say, let's be less technology specific. Let's be agnostic in that regard. But let's impose controls on the government, the executive branch, in terms of how it approaches any technology. And let's increase the reporting and accountability mechanisms inside of that such that we might know at any moment in time what the government is doing with that. I think that uh, that required the court to have a greater understanding of the technology. So as opposed to backing away and washing its hands of it, it actually stepped forward and said, I'll keep a close watch on the technology. I'll try to understand what actually is happening in that. Um, at the same time, the government had to take greater account of what the legal implications, policy implications were as it chased this royal, which is technology. So my view is that your answer um, is in your question, which is that I think it's going to require um, a greater application of a technology perspective from those who are responsible for the legal regime and a greater in investment on the kind of folks like me, the technologists or the operational practitioners um, of legal right, thought, practices, and principles. I tell you, I've been in this job now for seven and a half years and somebody had asked me at the beginning of this, what do you think is going to be the most challenging um, kind of dialogue, what's going to be your most challenging thing, I would have probably innocently said in August of 2006, the royal technology chasing that as our adversaries make greater and greater use of it. That's not, that's only been half the story. My greater challenge has been reconciling that to legal practice, policy, and law um, when those things change at very different rates. Um, my discussions with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, um, kind of reflecting personally, um, have been uh, met with an equal fervor by them to try to understand technology. I'm really comforted by that. Um, they put me through my paces asking really hard questions of why do you do that, how does that work, what's going to happen next, are you being lucrative or illustrative? Um, I think that's the kind of dialogue we have to have more frequently, more richly. Um, neither of us can simply cede right, some other dimension of this to some other quarter, to you know, me, to the lawyers, to say, hey, you bought this, it's your problem that the technology kind of defies your expectations. They need to be accountable for it. I need to be accountable for it. We need to be in that dialogue frequently. This venue helps in that regard. Yes, sir. Um, thanks. Um, there's a program uh, outlined recently in the Washington Post called Muscular, uh, which um, talked about uh, NSA's intercept of information sort of to and from Google and Yahoo's and other companies, uh, sort of private clouds, for, for lack of a better term. Since those companies were already complying with government requests for information, uh, why did NSA feel the need to intercept uh, uh, their information in a different way? Um, one uh, person at Google described it as uh, breaking into the house that they already had the keys to the front door to. Yeah. And so I'm hoping you can outline that logic. I, I can. It, it's, it's a complicated answer. It requires a, some greater amount of time. And, and I don't know how close to get to um, perhaps something that would reveal right, you know, some uh, particular application of our time and talent. But I think I can get you close enough. Um, let me, by way of analogy, say that, um, and, and this is going to seem like a, a dodge of the question, but really we'll come back to main point. If in the middle of World War II I was chasing Axis powers, right, their communications, say, as they kind of, kind of did command and control of submarines to and fro across the North Atlantic as they were trying to blow up ships that were resupplying Great Britain, I would have stood in the middle of those communications and not knowing precisely when and where a communication might come, come by, I would examine that communication, determine whether it had the necessary attributes to say that's probably command and control for a submarine or a tender. Um, and then I would kind of grab that communication if it meant right, that uh, perhaps those criteria. 
I would lay it on my bench stand, and I would often find that they were encrypted in what in those days was the Enigma encryption scheme. And I would then have to figure out how to kind of depackage that, how to take that apart and find the secret inside of that. It would tell me something about command and control that would then enable um, a US Navy or a United Kingdom Great Britain ship in those days to do what they needed to do. Um, pass forward now to the year um, 2013. Um, if I know a selector, right, let's say I know the telephone number or the email address associated with an adversary, um, and I have reason to believe that they make use of Google or Yahoo or other such services, the 702 authority does, in fact, give me the ability to go to the front door um, and essentially present that and get a pristine copy of whatever it is that that adversary might be doing. Uh, but oftentimes, I don't know um, what that selector is or what that email address is, and I'm in some place um, much like I was in World War II, where I'm standing in the middle of a lane, right? I'm watching things go back and forth between what I have high confidence on our adversaries on one side and the other, imagine communications that might be waking their way from the you know, government spaces of Pakistan to perhaps you know, the outlying areas in Yemen. Um, and as they go by, I try to discern, um, you know, lawfully um, exercising what I would call my executive order of <laughs> military authorities. I'm in a foreign place. I'm chasing a foreign thing. They, in fact, are a foreign in a foreign place. Uh, so those three questions line up in that particular way, such that 702 is not the authority I bring to bear, the executive order 12333. And what goes by, and I have high confidence based now upon that discovery, um, is something that is of bona fide foreign intelligence interest to me. It might be encrypted. It might be something that has um, compression technology. It's been compacted so that it can more efficiently make its way across that lane. I mean, it might be wrapped by Google, it might be wrapped by some Pakistani service, it might be wrapped by somebody, right? I have to know how to actually kind of tease the secret out of the middle of that. And so at any moment in time, I have to actually be prepared to, if I find an artifact that is a bona fide foreign intelligence interest to me, I have to be able to prosecute what I call thousands of protocols, right? Things that are wrapped <laughs> by some particular kind of entity on the planet Earth, um, that I need to figure out how to unwrap this and figure out what the secret is inside of that. Um, used to be in the old days when the Soviet Union was in one place and we were in another, um, I could always say with high confidence, I have 100% confidence that this thing is going to be something that will not intrude right upon you know, the privacy of the U.S. person. Um, that's less so today. And so that's why when I have the authority to do the kind of work that I've just described, I also have a burden that persists, which never goes away, which is that I have to be mindful that I might, in fact, against all my expectations, encounter a U.S. person. I might, in fact, find something in there that I'm not authorized to touch, and the minimization rules come along with that. And so that's the answer to the question, which is that um, if I have my confidence up front, I know exactly what I'm after, and I know where to get it. The front door is the most efficient, effective, and I think lawfully appropriate way. Uh, but that's not always the case, and I sometimes discover things in you know, the backwater areas of the world that I have to figure out, you know, if there's a secret inside of that, how do I get to it? To say this in closing, um, that if I were um, to essentially target Google the institution or Yahoo the institution or any American-based institution um, without probable cause, that would be a violation of law. We could continue this all day, but I think we have time for just one more question. I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. Right. Uh, so, I don't think I need to answer, but I'll be happy to repeat the question. So, Thank you very much, Mario Loyola, visiting fellow here in the law school. Um, one fascinating thing about this whole controversy has been that the, having seen the iterative process up close in 2008, I was Senate staff in 2008, having seen up close the iterative process over an entire year of negotiating uh, that led to the law as it's structured now, it's pretty clear to me that we, I'm pretty convinced that we've, we're very close to an optimal balance of safeguards and authorities and that the crisis that we have of public confidence in the NSA has to do with other things. And, it's, and so I wanted to know what your view is of what's led to the crisis in public confidence and how you, you use your limited ability to shape the institutional part when the institutional part is not really, I mean in my view, perhaps in your view also, what's led to the crisis in public confidence. So that's a general question. And then real quick, a specific question. Could you go into more detail about the uh, negotiation, the informal coordination with the FISA court as you go through and make sure that they approve the DNI and AG certifications? Yes. Um, so I'd like to take the first part as a rhetorical question. Um, but but I, I tend to agree with you. Um, 
that uh, Morgan Lovell, um, kind of an institution that I think writes very various analyses, did a paper, actually released this paper before June 5th that's meritorious because they essentially spoke to this issue uh, before this became, you know, a kind of cause to let across the summer. And in that paper, they kind of describe and do a survey of various um, governmental um, regimes. Um, broadly kind of considering um, European, um, to some degree Latin American, but American legal regimes. And came to the conclusion that the Americans are far ahead of the rest in terms of applying due diligence law, right, and good judicial practice to the kind of imposition of, of legal um, procedure to the application of what I would call lawful intercept. I do think that we have a sweet spot. We're at the head of the pack in terms of it's hard for me to imagine that we could be more rigorous in the application of those controls. That said, uh, the public confidence has been significantly weakened across the summer. I think in part because we've been speaking in sound bites. So for example, when what was released um, in the early part of June as the secondary order, right, an order from the government, the court actually, to um, the telecommunications um, entity, said you are to provide all of the metadata records for telephone traffic to NSA. What was missing in that was the primary order, which is considerably longer, which imposed all the controls right upon them. Um, which, when looked um, at once, kind of in, in fair measure, would have said, well, right, the government is not worried just about national security, which really is the secondary order, right, to give, give this defense that they might affect national security, but the defense, the protection of you know, privacy and civil liberties. Um, now, we might disagree with the balance that's struck in that regard, but we would have had a proper dialogue from the very get-go if we had the totality of that on the table and said, let's look at all of it um, and let's have a policy debate um, you know, where we can have a rough and rude conversation, collision of ideas, but not necessarily of people. With respect to the back and forth between the executive branch and the judicial branch, um, I would say it's quite rich. Um, I mean, it can be richer, um, but, but not for want of um, time, energy, and passion on the part of the court. Right? I mean, it's just only so many things that you can get your arms around so that you are exhaustive about understanding how the internet works or cyberspace works. So you are going to be surprised at what you then have to have Right, are the relationships and the mechanisms that immediately identify that surprise, which will engage and interdict right, that surprise <coughs> that's going in a direction you don't prefer, and will fix it. Um, and the confidence that comes from um, all sides are trying to honestly, um, essentially, affect the right um, reconciliation of law, policy, operational practice, and technology. Again, those things don't naturally synchronize, and so my response would be, illuminate the controls we have, impose additional controls, <coughs> if, that's your, um, if that's your preference, <coughs> Um, and increase the frequency and the richness of the dialogue and hold all parties accountable to essentially figure out, you know, what's the dimension that my counterpart is offering and how do I help that kind of also come into play. So I can't be agnostic about the law, the court can't be agnostic about technology, we need to meet on that and we do frequently and richly. I've left out the National Security Division of the Department of Justice, which does yeoman's work as an interlocutor, both holding me accountable, but also representing me to the court. It's an unenviable position to be in, but I think they do that really well. Um, I'm mindful of the time. I know that uh, we're probably out of time. If I could just close by saying thank you. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to have uh, what hopefully has been at least a down payment on that dialogue. I'm especially appreciative to the center at New York University for creating this venue.